So we talked about data. We've talked about design. Now let's talk about the biggie. Let's talk about the biggie. 62% of sales people, according to the state of Salesforce, believe that when companies move a process into Salesforce, it's an improvement. 62%. OK, maybe that's a good number. Maybe you'd argue that 38% of them don't think it's a great idea to move this stuff into Salesforce. At the end of the day, that's the experience that we need to make, make amazing. Your employees own the narrative. The data and the design, that's the medium. But your employees tell your stories. Your employees tell the stories. And it used to be we'd say, you know, you need to kind of use the carrot and the stick to get them to use this stuff. The stick's gone. Uber doesn't give you a stick. It just gives you a carrot, and it gives you chocolate, and it gives you lemonade. Your employee's ability to tell your narrative passionately is 100% tied to your culture. It's 100% tied to your culture. And everything you are all working on right now needs to take that culture into account, needs to think about that culture, needs to understand what it is, needs to understand how to influence it. That will help dictate how to put live data perfectly designed into the hands of your employees. But that's a big topic. So we are very fortunate today to have a best-selling author to talk to us about culture and to define for us what a culture is and why does a culture resist change. So without further ado, please give it up to best-selling author, Mr. Stan Slap. Come on. Stan, thank you so much, my man. Thank you. All right, how you doing? All right, we'll fix that. So before we get started here, let me just see a show of hands. How many people in this room are actually managers with head count? Raise your delicate, well-manicured fingers. Okay. How many of you would, would classify yourself more as the managed? Raise your tough, callous, working-class hands, please. Okay, managed? I'm, I'm going to be talking about you here today. I'm going to be talking about how much power you really have over the success of any strategy. Don't you start getting all snarly and cocky going, <laughs> your career could take a sudden wrong turn. You could become a manager that fast. You're going to wish you'd listen to this information. <laughs> now, I know that, that you're here for all sorts of reasons at this event, in this room, but, but one of those reasons must be to learn something. And there are two ways to learn anything. You know this. There's data and there's experience. And there's two types of experience. There's good experience and there's bad experience. And even though we all like to claim we're nibbling from the higher branches by this point in our evolution, let's face it, it's most often the bad experience that finally claims our attention. Which is why, before we even get started today, I'd like to dedicate our time together to the one company which in recent memory has committed the most boneheaded act. An act that is not so anti, just so anti-business sense, it's so anti-common sense that it can only be interpreted as a selfless act, as a noble gesture so the rest of us may learn what not to do and so grow and prosper in our own organizations. Now, competition for the dedication spot in this talk has been understandably fierce. Um, uh, and I, it would have been easy to pick a, a company in the United States, but we do business in my company in 70 countries, so I thought I'd look outside our own borders, and I did, and I found the company worthy of the dedication spot for our talk today. So I would like to dedicate our time together today to Aeroflot, the Russian airline. Has anybody here ever flown Aeroflot? Okay. Has anybody here ever flown United? Hey, you've flown Aeroflot, pretty much the same thing. <laughs> And Aeroflot management, everything I tell you here today is true. Aeroflot management in the desperate bid to cure sagging revenue has leaped upon a new consumer promotion which they announced in the business press in Eastern Europe. And according to Aeroflot management, the airline is soon to implement its first ever Smile Day. And according to Aeroflot management on Smile Day, every employee of the airline will be under orders to, quote, smile unceasingly at customers for the entire day. 
Like, and they were asked in this article, well, what, if, what if Smile Day is a success? And their official corporate spokesperson responded, well, if Smile Day is a success, we will consider implementing it on an annual basis. <laughs> and I thought, you know, it is exactly this treatment of, of symptom over sickness that's responsible for the chronic ills that business faces today. Because the problems that continue to baffle and bedevil managers in every industry, in every company, in every line of business, in every country, well, they're not really new problems. The biggest problem is that the solutions are not really new solutions. And nowhere is that more the case than when it comes to a subject like maximizing the commitment of your employee culture, which is what I've been asked to talk to you about today. Now, <laughs> maximizing the commitment of your employee culture is a big subject. We could spend a lifetime talking about maximizing the commitment of your employee culture. I don't have a lifetime to spend talking about maximizing the commitment of your employee culture. I have 25 minutes. So I figured I had a choice. I could make the 25 minutes seem like a lifetime to you. Or I could focus on what's most important. And today, I am going to focus on what's most important. And what's most important, first of all, is that culture is, was Merriam-Webster's word of the year last year. So according to the largest dictionary in the English language, culture was the most searched for word in the English language. And so we know it's the most overused yet least understood concept in business. And the second important reason I'm going to focus on what's most important is that like any company, your company is regularly betting its life on the ability to roll out new strategies into the marketplace, ahead of budget, ahead of schedule, on the heads of your competitors. But most strategies in most companies don't really work. They really don't. If you take a hard post-mortem look at most strategies in most companies, they don't really do what they're supposed to do. They don't really cost what they're supposed to cost. They don't really happen when they're supposed to happen. Most strategies in most companies only look like they're moving forward because they're being slammed from behind by the next strategy. Okay, don't give me the look. I'm talking about every other company but your company has this problem, okay? And that's because even the smartest companies in the world regularly subscribe to the most dangerous strategic myth that a successful strategy has to be planned well, when in fact a successful strategy has to be implemented well. And implemented well starts with being able to enroll the ferocious support of your employee culture. If you can do that, well, you're on your way to achieving performance insurance, but you are building a base camp on Mount Delusional if you think that any strategy, any performance goal will ever be successful without the hardcore support of this particular group. And because it's always darkest before it turns pitch black, let me make it even worse for you. Your customers are generally employees somewhere, too. And that means they're part of the overall employee culture. And they will decide to protect or reject your company based in part on how they perceive you treat people just like them. Now, unless there are renowned circumstances, you're known as the best employer in the world or the worst employer in the world, a lot of that perception is going to be an intuitive mind meld between your people and your, your customers. But it's going to be based in large part on what kind of legitimate enthusiasm your people show for your products, your pricing, your policies. Because as an employee somewhere themselves, your customers know they would never show that same kind of legitimate enthusiasm unless they're being treated with a certain type of deep and rare respect. Now, maybe you're thinking this shouldn't be an issue at all. When, when you think about the strategies that consume you in your company, what are the goals of those strategies? What are they? Increase revenue? Improve margin? Better customer satisfaction? Faster time to market? Make market share? Don't just make market share, take market share and hold it without diluting margin? World domination? Which employee working for any of you could ever argue with the irrefutable logic of these corporate strategies? In a perfect world, your people wouldn't argue at all they'd immediately grasp this logic and devote themselves wholeheartedly toward achieving them. Well, wake up, wipe the drool from your desk, and say hi to reality. Because in the real world, neither business logic, nor management authority, nor any compelling competitive urgency will ever convince an employee culture to adopt a corporate cause as if it were its own. In that killing field between company concept and cultural commitment, lies many have failed strategic plan. 
You want your people to buy some new strategy or performance goal from you? That's fine. But it means you have to know how to sell it to them. That means knowing how to sell to an employee culture, knowing how a culture works and how to work it. Now, I can tell you right now, this is not a matter of informing your employee culture about anything. It's a matter of inspiring it. It's not a matter of PowerPoint or even bonus programs. It's a matter of vision and values. And it is not a matter of logic. It's a matter of logical methods for stirring deep response. It is not the responsibility of your employee culture to understand the business logic. You want to be successful? Then it's a responsibility of the business to understand your culture's logic. So what is an employee culture? Well, for one thing, I'll tell you what it's not. It's not a bunch of employees. When your employees formed a relationship with your company, they became a culture. A culture exists to protect itself. So a culture is far more intelligent than just a bunch of employees. And it's far more resistant to standard methods of corporate influence. What a culture is also is not is a new concept. The earliest definitions of culture go all the way back to Margaret Mead in the jungles of Samoa, defining what a culture is. And the, the foundation of anthropology will tell you that a culture happens whenever you get a group of people who share the same basic lifestyle, environment, and traditions. And they, they band together to share the beliefs of how to survive and prosper emotionally. In this, tri in this jungle, in this tribe, with this chief, how do I survive? And knowing that I'm going to be okay, how do I get rewarded emotionally and avoid punishment? Well, the same conditions exist in your company, because you have a group of people who all share the same basic lifestyle, environment, and traditions. They all work in your industry. They all work in your company. They all work on your team. They all work for you. And so, and so you have a culture. And once you understand an employee culture, it's the simplest operating system in the world. An employee culture is an information-gathering organism designed to assure its own survival. That's its own survival, not yours, not the company's. And the, an employee culture does not necessarily make a connection between its own survival and prosperity and that of the companies. Aligning those two things is the key to cultural commitment. This is baffling to many managers who say, wait a minute, wait a minute, my culture is concerned about survival? Okay, I can handle that. Do your job and you'll keep it. How is that? What did I miss? Oh, emotional pride. Yeah, and we'll tell you you're doing a great job. Well, that only works if your employee culture identifies a reliable through line between what happens to the company and what happens to the culture. That's rarely the case. And that's rarely the culture's fault. So it's important to understand that you cannot bribe, bluff, or bully an employee culture into sustainably believing or doing anything. You can't tell the culture what to believe. You can't stop it from existing. Your culture's antenna is working constantly, 24-7, tracking you, seeking information. Its, its credibility detector is alarmingly accurate. Its, its perceptions are alarmingly accurate. Its memory is elephant time. But what you can do here is take comfort from recognizing that your employee culture is the most rational organism in the world. It is solely concerned about its survival and emotional prosperity. It, it wants to know what the rules are so it can orient itself in your environment and understand how to best assure its survival and emotional prosperity. And so it is an open system. It's an agnostic system. It's an objective system. Your culture doesn't even mind bad news. It minds whether it can trust who's giving it the news. And it's an open system. It has to constantly be open to input because it has to update what it perceives are the rules of survival and emotional prosperity. Now, what do you do with this information? Well, first, a brief horrific recap in case you missed the implications. A great culture, the definition of a great culture is a committed culture. The performance of a committed culture can be measured by any standard business metric. Any metric you use to manage performance success in the business can be applied to cultural commitment. And uh, 
And if a culture wants something to happen, it's going to happen. If the culture doesn't want it to happen, it's not going to happen. So keep this in mind. Who is going to decide the success of any strategy or performance goal in your company on your team? If you're running the team, start by crossing yourself right off the list. Your employee culture has the first vote. Your culture is an independent organism with its own purpose, living right inside your company, right inside your team, with all the power to make or break any management plan and any manager right along with it. Your culture is genetic. Everybody that is an employee in your company or on your team is a member of the employee culture. There's no onboarding period. There's no probationary period. Uh, there's no rope line. Uh, because the more people looking for, for the rules of safety in a location that's safe watering hole, the safer it is for everybody. So any employee who joins your company from minute one, they get a visit from the cultural welcome wagon, and they are part of your employee culture. Well, there is one exception. That would be you. You are not part of your employee culture. You are management standing outside the culture trying to sell it something. You're part of the manager culture, but you're not part of your employee culture. Even if you're friendly with your people, even if you're friends with some of your people, even if you used to be one of your people and got promoted. Now, you have a special place in your employee culture. <laughs> it's a lonely place, but it's special. You're the chief. You are the chief. Don't be getting a swell head about that. Chief is not some honorary title bestowed upon you in abject appreciation by a devoted, humble employee culture. It's just short for chief subject of all the stories the culture tells about you. Next, a culture is hereditary. It is a belief system, a constantly recalibrating belief system passed down from one tenured generation to another. So there may be an incident that has defined the employee culture's understanding of what is real in this company. And those who bore witness to that original incident may be long gone from the company. The belief system will remain intact until it's altered in a convincing way for your employee culture. So if you're thinking, well, I can fix this. I just have to get rid of all my employees and shutter the company for a couple of years, put a fumigation tent around it, and uh, hire a new team, maybe out of the remote mountains of Nepal, and march them slowly down the cliffs, put them in the slowest boat I can find, and when they finally dock, trudge them all the way back to the company, which has now been shuttered for three years, take down the fumigation tents, and sit these bewildered Nepalese at the desks formerly inhabited by my employee culture. The first second of the first minute of the first hour of the first day, they sit at those desks. They will immediately know all this belief system. It lives in the air. And this is not the the inspirational part of my talk to you. Okay. It gets better. Um, the culture is also neurotic. You can't blame your culture for being neurotic. Your employee culture is trying to understand, to confirm the known rules of survival and emotional prosperity in an environment it cannot reliably anticipate or control. Of course it's going to be neurotic. That's on a good day. On a bad day, it's completely nuts. And ironically, some of the worst days for your employee culture are the best days for the enterprise because it is just confirmed for the culture the gap between what happens to the company and what happens to the culture. All right. So here's two things tactically you can do right now to begin to increase the commitment of your employee culture. First, if you can respect the power of your employee culture, you have to go to the power source and you have to make sure that culture is fully charged. Now, a culture is an organism, and like any organism, it needs energy to survive. But an employee culture has an extraordinary need for energy because the culture's entire business is to remain open on constant input, to take in all information it can find, what's being said, what's not being said, facts, trends, patterns, happenings, rumors, and crunch it to extract hopefully reliable data it can use to update the known rules of survival and emotional prosperity. Now that's exhausting work. That would be exhausting work if that's all your culture had to do, like sitting on the couch playing a video game. It can't sit on that couch. You're forcing it off the couch in a constant forward motion down a dark, dangerous, unproven, unlit road. So the culture is being pushed to move fast 
and ever faster. It's not sure if that road is safe, so it's trying to resist. And it's this jerky, uncoordinated, kind of like disco night at the Toledo Elks Club kind of movement. And so the culture has to keep constant defense shields up against the, to protect against the unknown while it's trying to figure out how to move quickly and safely on your behalf. Now, you can demand whatever energy you want from your culture. And I, by the way, I'm not talking energy in some woo-woo sense. I'm talking the energy that translates into discretionary effort from your employee culture, into resilience, into flexibility, into accountability, into innovation, into evangelism, that kind of energy. You can demand whatever you want from your culture, but you have to resupply it as you go. You do not want your employee culture's energy to fall below the waterline because if it perceives it's down to its remaining stores, it's going to shut down any of the expense on discretionary effort. It's going to detach and hunker down and store all the energy possible to, to see how, what it's got to do to deal with what comes next. So demand whatever energy you want from your culture. Just re-up it as you go. And you can resupply an employee culture's energy in three dimensions. First, context, looking backwards. Why is this happening? If your employee culture can understand why something is happening, it doesn't have to use as much energy to wonder where to put this. Is this new piece of information a threat? Where does it fit? What does it mean? It can just slot it in. The problem is the employee culture rarely gets that information. It gets the introduction of new strategies all the time. It doesn't get an explanation of what happened to the old strategy. What, did the dog eat the old strategy? What happened to that strategy? So it's never really sure, should it commit or not? What does this mean? So when you are introducing something new to the culture, take the time to introduce, uh, to explain what happened to the old, which is why you have the new. Don't just pile one thing on the other. Management is focused on, on success, so it's always looking forward to see what can be sold next. Your culture is focused on survival. It's always looking backwards to see what happened to the last thing it was sold and whether that worked out the way it was promised. The next is predictability. Looking forward, what is going to happen next? If you introduce anything new to the culture that you want the culture to do, do you think your culture could confidently say, well, in any scenario, planned or unplanned, that we're going we're gonna to face between here and getting to there, we pretty much know how the company would act in those circumstances. If they can't, the culture is burning through energy, wondering about the threat potential. So conduct predictability drills with your culture before you ask it to do anything. Here's where we're going. Here's what could happen. Here's what we would do in those circumstances. And finally, sense of self, which is looking inward. How will affiliating with this company make us feel better about ourselves? Now, everybody who works, including everybody in this room, has got to constantly answer two questions. From people who don't know you that well, or you just met, it's, so what do you do? From people who know you the best, it's, so what did you do today? If the answer to those two questions does not grant your employee culture a better sense of self by affiliating not with what you do or, or even how you do it, but why you do it and the true character of the company, then every time they get asked those questions, they're losing energy. The second thing to do is don't ever blame your culture for how it's treated. As an example, your culture is not naturally change resistant. That's just, that, it's just responding to how change is introduced to it. Now, it's true, you introduce change to your employee culture, you're probably gonna get one of two kinds of resistance. You may get overt resistance, which means it's too late to prevent it. Maybe you get lucky and you'll get covert resistance, which just means you don't realize it's too late to prevent it. Why does an employee culture notoriously resist change? Now that you know what a culture is, you can finally answer that question. What is an employee culture obsessed with? Protecting the known rules of survival and emotional prosperity. What does any strategic or organizational change do? Messes with the known rules of survival and emotional prosperity. I used to, to know my job, now you're changing it. I have to, to relearn, re-earn my competence. I used to have relationships I could depend on. I knew people, they knew me. Now we're being reorged. I don't have those anymore. I used to know what my bonus meant when I got it and more important, when I didn't. Now you've got some groovy new comp program with a higher ceiling, but I don't know what it means. And so it's not that your employee culture actually 
hates change. Your employee culture hates the loss that change represents, the loss of the known. So, quick antidote to that. What happens in those circumstances, first of all, is your culture loses perspective. It didn't see this change coming, so any change is an uncomfortable reminder of how little control it has over its own work life. Maybe anything will change. Maybe everything will change. And it triggers the neuroses that is always lying dormant in a culture anyway. And so the culture loses perspective. The most important thing you can do to sell change to a culture is to restore its perspective. And I'm going to tell you what to do about that, and it's going to seem so simple, it'll seem like nothing at all. But it's the thing that companies always tilted toward the bigger, the better, the more consistently fail to do. When you're introducing change to your employee culture, you must take the time to explain what isn't changing. So if you've got 5, 10, 15 PowerPoint slides saying this is new, this is different, back them with twice that many to say, but this is who we still are, this is who we have always been, and this is who we will always be. And try and do not to do that in a patronizing tone of voice. The culture is as smart as management. In fact, since it's focused obsessively on its own survival, its perceptions are more acute, it's probably even smarter. It's not that it doesn't understand the strategy. You need to it to understand why it should get up from making the strategy happen. Also, a culture is not moved solely by money. A culture is concerned about its survival and its prosperity in that order. The prosperity is emotional, not financial. So the culture isn't as focused on money as the meaning of the money. The culture wants to know if you're asking us to do something new, work harder, work different, work more, and you're hanging out some bonus for us, shiny thing, shiny thing, shiny thing, and we do what we got to do to get that bonus. Is that bonus a reliable indicator of our increased safety? Does it provide context? Does it provide a sense of self? Does it confirm those things? So a culture uses money to buy meaning. Now, it's not that money's unimportant. The culture likes the money. It'll take the money, spend the money, enjoy the money, demand more money, but a culture cares most about what money can't buy. And the good news for you as management is you have an unlimited budget to provide what money can't buy. So, if the culture cares most about meaning and uses money to translate it into meaning anyway, skip the middlemen and give them the meaning. And finally, when we're talking about millennials, which we get asked in my company all day, well, what do we do about millennials? As, as, if, they were <laughs> as if they had the appreciation for tenure of an especially dim house fly. And they just didn't get it. Look, millennials, are, are, they're human beings, and they are part of an employee culture. They're looking for a reason to believe. Do not diminish expectations. Increase the reason to believe. And you will, you will retain their tenure far longer. So I'm going to wrap this up now with three rules, for the, uh, three things I want to tell you for the road. Um, one for you as an audience, one for you as management, one for you as managers. First of all, for you as an audience here today. I had 25 minutes to talk about this stuff. That's like a 25-minute workshop on the principles of neurosurgery. So grab those knives and good luck. I can't possibly explain to you everything about an employee culture, how it works, and how to work in 25 minutes. So my commitment on behalf of Blue Wolf, my commitment to you goes beyond this 25 minutes. If you have, uh, if you have any questions, any situations I can answer for you, Go ahead, send me a note, and I will, I will do my best to answer it for you. Culture, maximizing culture in managers, employees, and, and customers is what we do. It's what I know. Happy to answer that for you. There's also the book, um, Under the Hood. It's my second book. First one, Bury My Heart at Conference Room B, was about a manager culture. This is about an employee culture. And it is a hell of a pithy read, if I do say so myself. Now, for you as management, here's my number one recommendation to you. Do not plan strategies like bad kung fu movies, okay? Okay, okay. <laughs> Who here has ever seen a bad kung fu film? Okay, you actually only have to see one. You're automatically pre-qualified to see them all because they are all exactly the same. In every bad kung fu film, we have our hero who's a simple, humble kind of guy except he's also a blazing kung fu master, which is why he can be a simple, humble kind of guy, because he can kill you with a paperclip if you piss him off. 
And in every bad kung fu film, our hero's a normal kind of guy, except for one strange twist. There's just one thing that gets our hero's nose wide open in every bad kung fu film, and that is he loves walking down dark, deserted roads in the middle of the night. Hey, some people golf, it's just his thing. Invariably, in every bad kung fu film, that dark, deserted road leads to the town square, which is also dark and deserted because it's the middle of the night. And invariably, as soon as our hero arrives at the dark, deserted town square, he's promptly jumped by five bad guys. Now, they are also blazing kung fu masters. Evidently, everybody in town is a blazing kung fu master. Now, our hero would be toast. The movie would be over in 10 minutes, except for the strange etiquette found in every bad kung fu movie which is that only one of the bad guys goes after our hero at a time. And the rest wait docilely by till that guy is dispatched. It's like, my turn. Okay. They are five bad, dumb guys. And companies plan strategies the same way. You're going to conceive of a strategy, your go-to-market strategy, brand strategy, IT strategy, product strategy, whatever it is. You're going to conceive of that strategy. You're going to think it through very carefully. Then you're going to fund it and then you're going to execute it. And all of your competitors are just going to wait until you've done all of those things and then say, ah, our turn. Doesn't work like that. Competition is in meetings right now, too. Not as good as this one. But still, all the good work you've done to grow and protect your company, well, that's just dealt you into the game. Are you in the big game? You're in the game with the most aggressive, intelligent, well-resourced players around. The question is, which company wins the game? And the company that wins the game is the first company that understands this. You can't sell it outside if you can't sell it inside. Now, I'm just a couple minutes left, and so... Here's, here's a message to you as managers. And for those of you who are not managers, if you're still thinking about being a manager after these 25 minutes, congratulations. Um, I'd like you to consider now, throughout the day, throughout the weeks, throughout the months, what do you really want from your management career? You want to build a company? You want to make products? You want to make money? These are, these are very good things. You want to have a legacy impact on the lives of those who helped you do it, this is a great thing. You don't have to trade off the good things to get the great thing, but you have to want the great thing. Understanding the true motivations of an employee culture can be the difference between your company's success and extreme success or your career and your failure. Your career success and failure. But this isn't just about your company and your career. As a manager, you have a lingering impact on the lives of the members of your employee culture, inside and outside the company. If they are made to feel small at work, insecure, anxious, diminished, that's not going to stay at work. That's going to jump the fence and follow them home. Those same people are partners, parents, neighbors, voters. The toxic impact is incalculable. Culture is where humans gather in business. And a culture's profound search for safety and meaning is a reminder that we all have these same concerns. We all inhabit the same world. Treating your employee culture with empathy and respect is not simply a performance tactic or job requirement for you as a manager. It is a mirror that reflects your own true humanity. Thank you. Sam, thanks so much. It was okay. awesome. Thanks, thanks, Sam. Thank, Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. So what did we learn there? And what did I learn when I first met Stan a couple of years ago? We don't own our cultures. We own the data. And some of us are struggling with it. As the state of Salesforce shows, please pick one of these up on your way out or at the Blue Wolf booth. We own the design. We don't own the culture. So for the rest of the week, think about data, think about design, think about your culture and think about how to strike the right balance between what's possible and what's achievable now. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great Dreamforce.